All right. So we're going to move into the 80s and beyond now with this um, and see what we can do here. Always fun to start with a little music from the time period. Makes me want to go to a basketball game. <laughs> not a history because I can literally remember the entire time period. Uh, we are we are in my lifetime now. Um, yeah, I'm old, but you know. <laughs> so Jimmy Carter's the president here at the end of the 1970s. He served one term. It's not been a stellar term. In fact, it's been so bad that Jimmy Carter gets challenged from his own party. He gets primary. This is something that has very rarely happened. A sitting president almost never gets primary because it's very, very hard to, 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 to remove a, an incumbent. But this is kind of a unique situation because the person that primaries them is a Kennedy. It's this guy at the bottom, Teddy Kennedy or Edward Kennedy. Teddy Kennedy is the youngest of the Kennedy brothers. His oldest brother uh, died in World War II. His next brother went on to become president, John F. Kennedy, and was assassinated. The next brother was a senator from New York and was running for president when he was assassinated. And now Teddy Kennedy's up there holding the, the standard. Um, it's part of what we call the ABC movement. Anybody but Carter. There were a lot of people that were so dissatisfied with what Jimmy Carter had done that they would have voted for anybody as long as it wasn't Jimmy Carter. So some Democrats got behind this Teddy Kennedy run. And Teddy Kennedy probably ran in the wrong year. He probably should have ran in 88. But he thinks it's his year, challenges uh, – Challenges Carter, but some of his past comes out. Teddy Kennedy's run for the presidency is destroyed by a scandal of his own, the Chappaquiddick scandal. Now this had happened back in the 1960s, but it's still pretty fresh on people's minds. Teddy Kennedy was, um, he was known for being a bit of a party hound in his, in his younger days and, and chasing women. Well, he leaves a party out on Chappaquiddick Island one night with his, some people say secretary, some people say intern, uh, a girl that worked for him, for his campaign. And uh, they're heading somewhere from the party. And on the way home, Teddy Kennedy runs off a bridge into a river or a creek. Kennedy himself gets out. But the 22-year-old Mary Jo Kopechny drowns in the car. It might not have been that big of a deal at this point. It was an accident. It happens. But it's almost a full 24 hours before Teddy Kennedy notifies the police of the accident. And when they get there, they find Kopechny dead in the car. Why would you wait 24 hours to notify the police? Anybody got any ideas? It's got to be a reason. Uh, well, she definitely died in car wreck. It's speculated, now this is just speculation, it was never proven, but it was speculated that Teddy Kennedy was drunk and he wanted to wait a full 24 hours so the alcohol would be out of his system when the police came. So he's not charged with manslaughter. There were no charges brought up against him. He uh, uh, but gets away with it. Okay, That just proves that you're a Kennedy in Massachusetts sometimes. But most Americans realized that something fishy happened with Chappaquiddick. 
and Teddy Kennedy is very damaged by this. Now, even with all that damage, he almost beats Carter out of the Democratic nomination. It's at the convention where they're picking the nominee that there's a floor fight, and we really didn't know until the last minute whether Carter would get the nomination again or Kennedy would, would take it away. Uh, when they shook hands at the end and Carter won the nomination narrowly, it's not a pleasant handshake. Kennedy looks disgusted that he has to, that he's lost to this peanut farmer from Plains, Georgia. Um, so Carter does get the nomination, but he was greatly damaged by the primary. The Republicans, however, they pretty pretty quickly settled on their candidate. Um, hello, I went too far. It's possessed today. They settled on Ronald, Ronald Wilson Reagan. Ronald Reagan's a strange character. Uh, he had been governor of California, but he was an actor before he was a uh, politician. He had been a, a Franklin Roosevelt Democrat, a New Deal Democrat back in the 40s. But in the late 50s and early 60s, he kind of changed his mind about things. And he joined the super conservative wing of the Republican Party, the Goldwater wing of it, uh, the wing that wanted small government, uh, very much, excuse me, very much anti-communist. He was seen as kind of a loon, uh, a, a, a right wing nut. But he got the nomination. And John Anderson gets the Independent Party's nomination. There's three people running for president. John Anderson wasn't really a factor in this election. Uh, doesn't get any electoral votes and, and almost none of the popular vote. But Reagan does something that no Republican had done in 40 years. Reagan manages to capture the South. That just doesn't happen. The South is traditionally Democratic. It had been Democrat for a long time. Reagan is the guy that turns it Republican. Uh, something that Eisenhower did in a couple of states, but uh, and Nixon did in a couple of places with the Southern strategy. But Reagan is the guy that really captures it. Uh, he also captures the Senate for the first time in 25 years. This is a massive victory. Ronald Reagan wins 489 to 49. Very slowly, a step at a time, the hope for world peace. This is Reagan's, one of his ads. Slowly, we once slid into Korea, slowly into Vietnam, and now the Persian Gulf beckons. Jimmy Carter's weak and decisive leadership has vacillated before events in Angola, Ethiopia, and Afghanistan. Jimmy Carter still doesn't know that it takes strong leadership to keep the peace. Weak leadership will lose it. Of all the objectives we seek, first and foremost, is the establishment of lasting world peace. We know only too well that war comes not when the forces of freedom are strong. It is when they are weak that tyrants are tempted. Four times in my lifetime, America has gone to war bleeding. The message Ronald Reagan has carried to America is one of strength. Peace is made by the fact of strength, economic, military, and strategic. Peace is lost when such strength disappears, or just as bad, is seen by an adversary as disappearing. The message Ronald Reagan has carried to America is one of restraint. I have repeatedly said in this campaign that I will sit down with the Soviet Union for as long as it takes to negotiate a balanced and equitable arms limitation agreement designed to improve the prospects for peace. The message Ronald Reagan has carried to America is one of confidence. Whatever else history may say about my candidacy, I hope it will be recorded that I appeal to our best hopes not our worst fears, to our confidence rather than our doubts, to the facts, not to fantasies. And these three, hope, confidence, and facts, are at the heart of my vision of peace. Strength, restraint, inspired leadership. The time is now. Reagan for president. Pretty effective ad showing that, that America was in a bad place, we wanted something different. And Reagan's promising peace 
He's promising hope to people. This is what his victory looks like. Uh, pretty big victory. Reagan carries all the red states. Carter, the only southern state Carter took was his home state of Georgia. So, who is this guy Reagan? Let's, let's kind of get to know him a little bit. Again, he was, he'd been a, a kind of a B actor in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, he, uh, he played some, some, some decent characters, uh, but he kind of got into the politics in the 50s when he became president of the Actors Union, the Screen Actors Guild. And that's when he starts shifting over to, to the Republican conservative idea a little bit. Runs for governor of California, is governor from 66 to 74. When Barry Goldwater runs for president, he gives, they call it the speech, he's the guy that nominates Barry Goldwater, and that was kind of the speech that launched him on a national scale. Uh, very much a different kind of Republican from others. He is uh, able to capture the working class, somebody that is traditionally very, very Democrat. Um, he was a populist kind of like Theodore Roosevelt was. He was really good at speaking directly to the American people. They, uh, his nickname was the Great Communicator because he, you know, nobody spoke directly to the American people better. Uh, Clinton was pretty good at it later on too. Uh, and he was a cold warrior, hates communism, hates communism with a passion, and takes on the Soviet Union face to face, is not one to back down from it realizing that America's strength wasn't all the guns and all the bullets we had. Our strength was that we had the strongest, most stable economy in the world. And he saw the Soviet Union wasn't. And he bankrupts the Soviet Union by getting them into an arms race that they couldn't keep up with. They didn't have the money we had. That bottom picture is of Ronald Reagan standing atop the Berlin Wall on the, uh, on the capitalist side of it where he famously looks at Mikhail Gorbachev, the premier of the Soviet Union, and says, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. Now, it doesn't happen during Reagan's administration. It's gonna happen in the next administration in George H.W. Bush's. But Reagan is gonna be the person that first calls for the, for the Berlin Wall to be, to be torn down. Am I going too fast for y'all? Y'all getting it? His, uh, his term as president often been called the Reagan Revolution. He puts together a strange group of people, this group of people that they call the neocons, the neoconservatives. Uh, these are young con uh, conservatives in their 20s and early 30s. They very much against government interference in anything. They are free market capitalists. Oh, excuse me. And they can't stand the Soviet Union. They want to. They want to take it down. The other group that he pulls in is weird. A group they call the Boll Weevils or the Reagan Democrats. These are your blue collar, day laboring uh, Democrats in the South. These are your mechanics and your oil field workers and your welders, guys that had always been Democrat, but they like this guy Ronald Reagan, and they cross over. Uh, supporters of Reagan would see government as the enemy. Reagan once famously said, government's not the solution, government's the problem. Okay? Uh, very libertarian in, in, in that idea. Uh, he slashed taxes across the board. Everybody got a tax cut under Ronald Reagan. And that's going to give more money for people to, to, to spend. And that's also going to mean that we're going to have less money coming into the uh, the government and we're going to have deficit spending. Our deficit got out of control. Uh, drastically cut social programs. Reagan was against any kind of welfare, wanted to end it, uh, did not believe it was the government's job to take care of people. The government should, uh, again, get out of the way and let you take care of yourself. Kind of an interesting idea. He couldn't completely end the social programs, although he wanted to. He couldn't do it because the Democrats were still in charge of one of the houses of Congress. 
the Republicans had gotten control of the Senate, but they didn't control the House. Uh, so he has to work with uh, the Democrats in the House of Representatives to get things done. He did, <coughs> <coughs> he did dramatically increase spending in one area. To <coughs> defense spending. <coughs> Guys, I am sorry I sound terrible. I am sick. I'm coughing over here. He dramatically increased defense spending. Uh, he grew our Navy and our Air Force more than anybody had ever grown it before. In fact, under Ronald Reagan, our Navy became the largest Navy in the world, and it's remained that way. Uh, I don't know if y'all know how big our Navy is, but the, the United States Navy is bigger than the next 19 navies added up. If you took the next 19 countries' navies, put them all together, they would be smaller than our Navy. Okay? Reagan did that. Um, and again, part of that was intentional. He wants to bankrupt the Soviet Union. On March 6, 1981, I'm just a, a child at this point. I remember watching TV. And all of a sudden, the television show got interrupted with a news special, a news flash. The president, Ronald Reagan, was leaving a speech at a Washington hotel, came outside to see the press conference, or the press junket, is waving at them, and all of a sudden a gunshot goes off. A Texan, John Hinckley Jr., that's him, him there on the left in that car, rushes out of the audience and fires a shot, actually fires a couple of shots out of a, a 22, hitting the president and almost killing the press secretary, Jim Brady. Jim Brady was, was left paralyzed by a, by a bullet wound, went through his spine. And we watched it all on TV as the president was shot again. This is not very long, really, after, this isn't 20 years after Kennedy was shot, live on TV. Now we see another president shot live on TV. Reagan is, is tackled when the, when the bullet, or when, the, when it goes off, uh, they quickly catch Hinckley and arrest him. Reagan is, uh, at first they don't realize he's shot. Reagan, Reagan knows his side hurts, but he thinks his side hurts because he hit the ground and broke a rib whenever, the, uh, whenever he was tackled. So they start rushing him back to the White House to safety. And the Secret Service agent starts noticing blood pooling. Turns around, rushes into the hospital. Reagan wants to put this image on of being a tough guy. And he, and he was. I mean, he, he, he was an old Western actor. He rode horses. He cut his own firewood. He was that kind of guy. And he thinks America needs to see their president that way. So when they get to the White House, or get to the, the hospital, he refuses to be carried in. Instead, he walks in of his own power and waves at people. Uh, they said as soon as he got through the door, he collapsed. Reagan was kind of always known for being very quick-witted, had, a, had a, uh, a very rapacious sense of humor about him. And uh, he joked to the surgeon, right before they put him down, Ronald Reagan told the surgeon, I hope you're all Republicans. Uh, that's typical Reagan, Reagan sense of humor. Twelve days later, Reagan leaves the hospital. Now guys, Reagan is 69 years old and he's been shot and he's out of the hospital walking on his own power within 12 days. One week later, he addressed the, the Congress and the State of the Union where he gave a, 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 an hour-long address with one of the largest standing ovations in history. Both sides, of the Republicans and Democrats, stood and applauded Reagan because he had survived. Reagan seems like Superman. He's invincible. So why did this guy, John Hinckley Jr., shoot the president? Well, first off, he's just crazy. But he had seen a movie called Taxi Driver. And Taxi Driver, this is a scene from it here at the bottom, had Jodie Foster in it, the actress. You might know Jodie Foster from movies like Contact or 
you saw the original Freaky Friday. Jodie Foster uh, was in this movie, and she she apparently had a uh, apparently moved Hinkley. He fell in love with her when he saw her, and sent her a letter saying that he was going to impress her by doing something extraordinary. And what he chose to do was kill the president to prove his love for Jodie Foster. This was a bad idea. It turns out Jodie Foster was a Republican, so it was not a good idea. Uh, you know, shot the wrong person, but the uh, uh, the idea was there. By the way, John Hinckley Jr. is free now. He was uh, he was released from last year from the mental hospital and deemed to be uh, no danger to anybody, and he lives in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. So that's kind of terrifying. Yeah. So, what do we characterize the 80s with? Well, the, the, biggest, the biggest economic idea was what Reagan called supply-side economics and what his enemies called trickle-down economics. It was the idea that if you cut taxes on the wealthiest people, they would have more money to spend and then that money would trickle down to everybody else as they as they invested it by buying they buy a new boat somebody's got to build that boat and it gives people jobs. Uh, it works. Doesn't work immediately. The uh, the tax cuts do stimulate growth, but unemployment hits 11% in 1982. It's tough. Uh, Things are not looking good in 81, 82. And then in 1983, finally, things start looking better. People went back to work. Jobs got created. The stock market started going up. People had more money in their pocket. And that's going to be the image that we have in 1984 when Ronald Reagan is running for re-election. Ronald Reagan's re-election campaign was brilliant. He asked one question. He said, when you go vote, I want you to ask yourself one thing. Are you better off now than you were four years ago? And everybody in the country was better off in 1984 than they were in 1980. The economy was just better, okay? And it worked. Uh, turns out part of it was because of borrowing. Reagan was borrowing a ton of money. Our deficit got higher than $200 million in the 1980s for the first time ever. Boy, I wish we were still $200 million in debt. We are uh, four point something trillion dollars in debt now. But that was a massive amount. $200 million in debt was massive in 1983. So we talked about him as a cold warrior. How does he... Uh, how does he do this? What does he do as a Cold Warrior? Well, he, he blatantly attacks the Soviet Union. He refers to them as the evil empire, which is an interesting thing to do when you realize that Star Wars came out in 1977 and all of the, the empire were the bad guys in that movie. And he's, you know, he's, he's making that comparison. These guys are like Darth Vader, okay? And Americans got that. Uh, Reagan also believed in negotiating through strength. He didn't believe in negotiating with somebody from a place of, of weakness. Well, how do you negotiate through strength? Well, you do it like Theodore Roosevelt did. You park your gunboats off their shores and you aim your missiles at them and you go, let's negotiate or, or let's fight. And that's what we did. We threatened the world and it worked. He had some crazy ideas. Uh, SDI was a kind of crazy idea, the Strategic Defense Initiative, or as his opponents nicknamed it, the Star Wars program. He, uh, his plan was to weaponize space. He wanted to put satellites in space and arm them. So if the Soviet Union were to shoot missiles at us, these satellites could shoot the missiles out of the sky before they got to us. Sounds good. A missile defense shield. Sounds great. There's a couple of problems. First off, it's illegal because we had signed a treaty saying that you could never never militarize space. So that's a problem. And second, the technology doesn't work. It still doesn't work today. We keep trying it. 
the closest we've ever got to hitting a missile in practices was we got within 100 miles of it. Okay? It's very hard to track a missile flying through and, and march it uh, and hit it with another missile flying through. It would be like if, uh, if you and I went out in the pasture and you pulled your pistol out and shot it in the air and I pulled mine out and shot your bullet out of the sky. Okay? Very difficult to do. Uh, but we tried it anyway. Uh, very expensive. It was a, it was a colossal fail, failure for Reagan. Uh, the Soviet Union is mad at us. They boycott our Olympics in 1984. Uh, it was being held in Los Angeles. We were, it was okay with us because we won like every gold medal because we didn't have to fight the Russians. But uh, the, uh, that, that, was, that was their way of dealing with us. We won't participate in your Olympics. In the Middle East, things are, are, are showing signs of, of serious problems. Israel and Lebanon are having some, uh, some, some, some fights. Uh, Israel actually invades Lebanon briefly. Uh, the U United States has to send in troops to try and negotiate a peace. We sit in the Marines. We built this barracks there. Uh, and in 1983, an Islamic terrorist drives a car bomb through the front gate of the embassy and blows it up, killing about 200 Marines. Turns out that the rules, the, uh, uh, the government had not given these Marines the authority to carry ammunition because they were afraid that, uh, that they would start a war if they did. So the Marines that were guarding had rifles with no, no bullets in them. That's a club at that point. It doesn't do much good against a car uh, hurling at you with a, with a bomb in it. Um, Reagan goes and views all of the, the, all of the coffins. That's a picture of Reagan and his wife, Nancy. Uh, and for most presidents, this would have, they would have been blamed for it. But it doesn't stick to Reagan. We jokingly called him the Teflon president. You know what Teflon is? Y'all are too young probably to remember Teflon. That's the stuff they used to spray on the inside of pots and pans so food wouldn't stick to it. Okay? Don't do it anymore because when it chips off, it causes cancer, so they don't use it anymore. But they called him the Teflon president because nothing stuck to him. He managed to get away with things that other presidents couldn't do. Uh, because Americans genuinely loved Ronald Reagan or hated him. Loved or hated There was no middle ground. You either loved him or you hated him. Uh, I confess I was in one of those categories that just thought he was... I was almost hero worship of Reagan when I was a young man. Uh, I've since kind of changed my opinion of him a little bit. I don't like him quite as much as I used to. But, uh, yeah, he was, uh, he was, he was quite, a, uh, quite a popular president. Make some big mistakes, though. Like in Nicaragua. Am I going too fast, guys? You keeping up okay? If I go too fast, tell me. I'll slow down. Uh, Nicaragua was in the middle of a civil war. They had the Contras against the Sandinistas. The Sandinistas were communists, while the Contras were kind of democratic, kind of capitalist. Well, Reagan wants to help stop communism. So he wants to help the Contras. The problem is the Democratic House of Representatives will not approve any money for it. So how do you go about getting, getting past that? Well, Reagan sent in advisors, which were military troops. Uh, they weren't supposed to actually do the fighting. They were supposed to advise the Contras and, and, and all this. But we find out later they were actually fighting. And to finance it, we were selling guns to Iran. There's a picture of one of the missiles, the types of missiles that we sold to Iran. We were selling these missiles to Iran, taking the money and then using that money to finance the Contras. That's illegal. What Reagan was doing was completely illegal. In fact, he's almost going to get impeached over it. There's going to be Senate hearings over the Iran-Contra scandal. Uh, in the midst of all this, we have another election, Ronald Reagan, 1984. He is now the oldest man ever to run for president. He is 73 by this point. Uh, by the way, he's not the oldest anymore because Trump was 71 when he became president. So 
Uh, if Trump gets reelected, Trump will take this one too. Ronald Reagan is running for re-election with George Bush Sr., George H.W. Bush. And the Democrats nominate Jimmy Carter's former vice president, Walter Mondale, and he does something interesting. He, not, he picks Geraldine Ferraro as his running mate. She was the first female to ever be on a national ticket. So a female vice presidential candidate. Um, they thought that would energize the base and you'd be able to win this election easily with, uh, with this, this female on the ticket. The problem is Walter Mondale was so unlikable and had no charisma uh, that he's not able to, to, to defeat Ronald Reagan, who is just a charismatic, funny guy. Um, now, again, Reagan is the oldest man ever to serve as president. And there was some question as to whether or not his age was going to hurt him. Some people were saying that Reagan was, was tired and was falling asleep in meetings and it was forgetful. Uh, so it's a question, it's a big deal. Is Reagan too old? And Reagan has to find a way to get out from underneath this. Walter Mondale tries to make a big deal about how he's so much younger. He was in his late 50s as compared to your 70s. Um, Reagan de deals with it in a typical Ray Reagan way. I'll show you a film clip in a minute where you'll see it. Uh, I hope you find it funny. Some kids find it funny, others don't get it, but it's, it's Reagan wit at its best probably. Reagan wins 525 to 13 with this. See if I can turn it up for you. I can get it turned up a little. You already are the oldest president in history. Some of your staff say you were tired after your most recent encounter with Mr. Mr. Uh, Mondale. Um, I recall yet that President Kennedy had to go for days on end with very little sleep during the Cuba Missile Crisis. Is there any doubt in your mind? that you would be able to function in such circumstances. Not at all, Mr. Truitt and I, and I want you to know that also, I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. So with that one line, he put it all to, all to rest. Yes, I'm old, but do you want this young pump with no experience running things? And it worked. Reagan ends up having one of the largest landslides ever. Um, you can see how well he did. Uh, Mondale carried his home state. Uh, and really, that was it. He got a couple of votes up here but uh, in, in D.C. But that's a big victory. It would have really said that he'd lost his home state in Minnesota, too. By the way, only one president's ever lost his home state, and that was Al Gore in 2000. All right, so part of what allows Reagan to be Reagan is that there's a new chairman of the Soviet Union. Um, it's a guy named Mikhail Gorbachev. This is, uh, this is Gorbachev here, who is quite a bit different from anybody we've seen in the Soviet Union before. First off, he is much, much younger than, than premiers usually are. He's in his 50s, when usually your, your premiers are in their 70s. Um, and he's also a very weak communist. Yes, he's a communist, without a doubt. But he's willing to make some, some changes. There were two big ones, Glasnost and Perestroika. Uh, aren't you glad you don't have to, have to be able to pronounce those all the time? Glasnost was the idea that even in the Soviet Union, you could have some amount of freedom of speech. That's a big deal. Some political liberty. So newspapers were allowed to, to develop. Um, the Pravda, the P-R-A-V-D-A is the, the big newspaper. It used to be a state paper. Well, suddenly Pravda was allowed to write things that were critical of the government. That was a big deal. Uh, perestroika was out there, which allowed people to own property and own their own businesses. 
This is a new idea, something we had never seen before. Uh, the perestroika is going to be uh, uh, massive. It's going to show the people in the Soviet Union what, what happens if you're allowed to keep your money and you're allowed to, to own a business. And they liked it. And there's some problems with this. First off, it's going to be expensive to do this. Uh, so what do you do? Well, got to get the money from somewhere. They have to shrink the military machine. We can't, they can't afford to keep this giant army in the field. So they start take, making their, their military smaller. This is what Reagan was trying to do. He is bankrupting them. It is genius. Um, other problems with this is they're going to like it so much that within a few years, the Soviet Union is going to collapse because the young people are going to demand more changes, more freedom, more rights, more economic abilities. Uh, and we're going to see the largest nation in the world. The Soviet Union was the biggest nation in the world and it just collapses, ceases to exist. That's going to change the whole world. I'll let y'all finish right before I, before I move on. So Reagan goes and meets with Gorbachev. He had a series of summit meetings. And they're all dealing with the nuclear threat. Because honestly, the US and the Soviet Union have enough missiles that we could destroy each other over and over again. Reagan believed in a policy called MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. Reagan said the only way to keep us from being attacked by the Soviet Union is to have so many weapons that they know that if they attack us, we'll attack back and we'll all die. We will be mutually destroyed. Nobody would be stupid enough to sign their own death warrant. So there's a certain amount of security to everybody having guns, okay? But a lot of people are looking around going, the world's not safe. We need to get rid of the guns. We need to get rid of all this stuff, particularly the, the nuclear weapons. So they're negotiating the INF Treaty, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Force Treaty. And Gorbachev says something that nobody had ever done before. Gorbachev said, we'll destroy all of our weapons aimed at you. So all our weapons that are aimed at the US if you'll destroy the ones that are aimed at us. Now, they're not saying we're going to destroy all of them. We won't have any that are aimed at the United States if you don't have any aimed at the Soviet Union. And Reagan walks away from the deal. Says it's not enough. Demands that the Soviet Union destroy all intermediate range nuclear weapons. All or nothing. And he can do this because, because he knows they can't afford to keep running it, okay? The whole world is shocked. They're furious at Reagan for walking away. But Reagan said, wait, just wait, you'll see. And sure enough, at the next summit, Gorbachev agrees to everything that Reagan wants. He gets the, the, the treaty, and this essentially ended the Cold War. Uh, and he got it without giving up any, any of our own strength. Something that was, that was kind of impressive. I'm going to skip the Philippines argument because it's really not a, it'll never end up on your star test. Libya. Y'all ever seen this guy before? This is Muammar Gaddafi. Uh, Muammar Gaddafi was the leader of Libya for about 40 years. He was taken down and assassinated in a coup four or five years ago. Gaddafi hates the, 
hates the United States with a passion. And when a bomb blew up in a West Berlin disco, killing several American servicemen, he goes on television and claims responsibility for it. He wants credit for killing the Americans. Now, whether he did it or not, we don't know. There's a lot of people that speculate that he didn't do it. But he, at the time, he came out and bragged, I did this, I killed those Americans. And I remember watching TV, and all of a sudden it got interrupted and the president was on television. And he put up a picture of this guy. He said, this is Muammar Gaddafi, the mad dog of the Middle East. He has claimed responsibility for killing Americans. Let the lesson be told from here that this is what happens when you kill Americans. And the film clipped off, and you just all of a sudden saw this picture of a camera flying through the air. Didn't know what it was. Turned out it was a camera on the end of a missile. Mm -hmm. And it went right into Gaddafi's house. And we hit it. And we all got to watch it. Didn't kill Gaddafi, we did kill his son. But shut Gaddafi up for 20 years. Because the lesson was, if you, if you kill an American, we'll, we'll hit you directly. Americans felt safe. They felt powerful as, as we bombed Libya in 1986. Grenada. I'll be honest, we didn't have any business in Grenada. Grenada was a, had been a British possession. Uh, but there was a, a coup d'etat, an overthrow of the government. The communists overthrew the government, assassinated the elected prime minister, and the British didn't seem like they were going to do anything. Well, Reagan doesn't want any more countries being communists, so he sends the Marines in. And what we call Operation Urgent Fury. October of 1983, with no advance warning, we, uh, we land troops and we overthrow the government within just a few hours. Part of it was psychological. Y'all know what psychological warfare is? That's where you, uh, you kind of play with the minds of your enemy to make them easier to defeat. Okay? And we are really, really good at that. I'm going to show you a postcard here in just a second. I'll put it up here that we airdropped. The United States, as, as we landed, we flew helicopters and planes over, and we airdropped thousands of these postcards on the people of Granada so they could see them. Okay? Now, what we want to do is we want to make sure that the people of Granada are not going to come out of their houses and shoot at us. We want to be seen as saviors. So these are the postcards we dropped. People of Granada, your Caribbean neighbors with U.S. support have come to Granada to restore democracy and ensure your safety. That's great. Except most of the people in Granada don't read or speak English. What do they see? Holy crap, the Americans are coming, and that's what they look like coming. They were surrendering faster than we could get through there. The Americans, don't shoot. They were throwing their arms up and surrendering immediately. We, we hardly had to fire a shot. Because they knew this was coming after you. Now, I got news for you. This is scary. Say what you want to, but if you walk out your door and you see this marching down the street, you're going to be intimidated, right? Well, it worked. We did the same thing, by the way, in the Iraq War. We dropped a bomb, dropped leaflets that said that to be a Marine, you had to kill a member of your immediate family. They were surrendering to CNN. We've already talked about the Iran-Contra scandal a little bit, uh, where we sold guns to Iran to fund the Contras. Uh, guys like Oliver North, you've probably seen him on TV. Uh, 
he just retired as the NRA president yesterday, I believe. He, uh, he was the National Security Council advisor. Uh, he was taking, taking orders from John Poindexter, that's him at the top right, and Casper Weinberger, that's him at the bottom, the Secretary of Defense, ordering him to, to sell these guns. That's illegal. Selling those guns is illegal. Um, ultimately, in the Senate hearings, Oliver North is convicted, but the president pardons him, so uh, it's overturned. Uh, John Poindexter is convicted. It's also eventually overturned. And Casper Weinberger received a presidential pardon before he was, a, was convicted. So these three people all ended up um, getting away with what they did, okay? Uh, John Poindexter, less than the rest. John Poindexter dies very mysteriously uh, shortly after this. He steps in front of a bus and, and, is, and is hit. Uh, there's a lot of questions about, about Poindexter's death. This is my favorite part. In the 1980s, the conservative religious right was massive. It was this these Protestants that were very much against uh, uh, any kind of government control and very much the guardians of our society, our morality. They had formed a group called the Moral Majority, led by Jerry Falwell. And a subgroup came out of that called the Parents Music Resource Center, the PMRC, led by Tipper Gore, that's her there at the top. Tipper Gore was the wife of then Senator Al Gore, later on Vice President Al Gore under Bill Clinton. But at that time, he was a senator. And their goal was to clean up rock and roll music. That rock and roll music was just too dirty and we needed to clean it up to protect our children. I remember I was in high school at this point and I had a button with PMRC and an X over it and a button with Tipper Gore and some pretty nasty things written, said about her on it. Hated these, hated this lady because she was trying to steal my rock and roll music, you know? That, was, that wasn't cool. Apparently, the Senate had nothing better to do because the United States Senate had hearings over rock and roll music and whether or not it should be monitored. They wanted to, Tipper Gore wanted to put a ratings system on music, like there is a film ratings system, and have certain music that you couldn't buy unless you were over 18. Uh, very bizarre stuff. Well, the uh, three people come to the rescue. D. Schneider, that's this guy. If he looks familiar to you, uh, he's the lead singer to the band Twisted Sister. You know the song, We're Not Gonna Take It or I Wanna Rock. D. Schneider, John Denver, the country and western singer, and Frank Zappa, an old drugged out hippie, uh, who had, well, pioneer in punk rock. These guys are called, they volunteer to go in and defend music. The one that's the most interesting is D. He comes walking in. I'll show you an interview of him in a minute. Uh, actually, we're probably going to skip the interview. I'll just tell you the story now. He comes walking in to the Senate hearing, and he's got his t-shirt that's two sizes too short, short or too small, and it's ripped up, and his old denim jacket, and his jeans are too tight with holes in it, long hair, a little bit of eye makeup, walks into the Senate like this. And they immediately thought, man, this idiot, we, we got him, no problem. What they didn't understand is D. Schneider looks like a, a dunderhead. He looks like an old metalhead. And he is an old metalhead. But he's also got a degree in English literature. D. Schneider can talk. He is well-spoken well-written, uh, and he proceeds to give an incredibly eloquent defense of freedom of speech and how 
music should be free to uh, to say what it wants to and be interpreted by everybody in its own meaning. And then Senator Gore makes a mistake. Remember, his wife, Tipper Gore, is the leader of this group that wants to get rid of it. And Senator Gore decides to attack D. Schneider personally. He's on a list of albums called the Filthy 15, the 15 dirtiest albums. And one of the songs was Under the Blade. And he talks about, he gets Tipper Gore to, to, to explain what Under the Blade is about. And she says that Under the Blade is about sadomasochism and uh, violent sexual acts. And it should be banned because students, our, our kids are going to hear this and they're going to be, uh, they're going to want to participate in this kind of stuff. And he says, what do you have to say to this about this, Mr. Schneider? And Dee Snyder proceeds to explain that the song Under the Blade is about his lead guitarist and backup singer who had cancer of the throat. And he had to go in and have this cancer cut out, removed. And they'd written this song because he was afraid he would never get to uh, get to sing again. He'd lose, lose everything. And his polyp was removed. And it was a song about empowerment in this. To which point Al Gore says this, and I love this, says, well, how do you explain the fact that Kipper Gore thought this song was about sadomasochism and sex? Which Dee Schneider responds with the greatest line ever. I am sorry, Senator, I cannot speak to the dirty mind of the Senator's wife. And makes him look ridiculous. He then says that if you choose to give a rating system, I request that all of my albums get the dirtiest rating you have. And when they ask him why, they said, because putting a parental advisory warning will guarantee that every one of my albums goes platinum. Well, the government doesn't get involved, but the record industry, in order to stop it, creates this label, and this label voluntarily gets put on albums that have, that have, have bad lyrics. And was Dee Schneider right? Sure he was. If you go to the out CD, you get a CD, and this is on it, it will outsell the other version. How many of you buy the clean version of the song? Nobody does, right? You buy the one with this on it. Okay. I'm going to skip some of this. Come on. I'm going to have time to watch you talk. I have to come over here and kill it. Is that him that went in? That's Dee Schneider a couple of years ago in an interview. I'm going to skip a couple of these, these so we can just get through with this because we've got to get done. 1988, the Democrats are having a hard time picking a nominee. They ran seven people that were all incompetent. We jokingly referred to them as the seven dwarfs. Um, you'll recognize some of these names. Joe Biden, who is currently running for president. 30 years later, he's running for president again. Okay, This guy has been running for president since 1988. Uh, Al Gore, future vice president, Jesse Jackson, and then the two big guys at the bottom, Gary Hart and Michael Dukakis. Those are the two I want to talk about. Because uh, they're the two that actually seem like they've got a chance. Let's talk about Gary Hart. I love this story. Look at Gary Hart. He looks like a like a like a great presidential candidate. He looked like a Kennedy. He sounded like a Kennedy. He was well spoken. People were excited about Gary Hart. He was easily the front runner, expected to win the presidency. And then some rumors started going around that Gary Hart liked women a little too much. And they asked him about it at a press conference. And Gary Hart does what you should never do as a candidate. He challenged the media. They asked him, Mr. Hart, there's been accusations of you 
womanizing and having affairs outside of your marriage. What do you think? And this is what Gary Hart says. This is an almost direct quote. I can't remember exactly, but this is very close. He says, my life is really pretty boring. And if you think it's not, you should follow me around sometime. So they did follow him around. And they followed him all the way over to a boat where they took this picture of Gary Hart with his secretary on his lap. And you can't tell from where you are, but his shirt has the name of the, the boat that he was on. It was called the SS Monkey Business. So he's literally got monkey business on his shirt with his secretary on his lap in the picture. He's caught. Uh, they find all kinds of pictures of him after this. Um, Donna Rice, is, what's her name? Her life was almost destroyed by this, by being the other woman. Uh, ultimately, Gary Hart's campaign implodes. He's no longer the front runner. Miss Haynes, please call the high school office. Miss Haynes, please call the high school office. So this guy, Michael Dukakis, comes out. Now, Michael Dukakis had been governor of Massachusetts. Uh, he gets the nomination. He's a terrible choice for a couple of reasons. One, he talks kind of funny because he's Greek. Two, he's about this tall. And three, it looks like he shaved his eyebrows off and replaced them with Arkansas bush caterpillars. Okay? <laughs> And he needs to find a way to look like a tough guy. And it's really hard to look like a tough guy when you really look like a little ethnic doll, okay? So he takes this picture of him driving a tank. And this went on the cover of Time Magazine to try and make him look tough. But when Americans saw this, we laughed. Because to us, this doesn't look like a tough guy. It looks like a child playing in his daddy's tank, okay? <laughs> Uh, it did not work out well for him. The Republicans, uh, they don't have any problem picking their, uh, their nominee. They're going to pick the Vice President of the United States, George H.W. George Bush, President, uh, father of President George W. Bush, where he is going to win the election when he makes the promise. In a debate, they said, Mr. Bush, the economy is slowing down. Economists believe that you're going to have to raise taxes. How do you respond? And he looks right at the camera. He points at the camera and he says, read my lips. No new taxes. And the whole country cheered and we voted for him and he won the presidency and he immediately raised taxes. So, pitfall. This is what it looks like. Uh, George Bush wins pretty handily, all the red states. Let's skip some of this. Some of this I can remember like it was yesterday. I was working at Sears in high school when this happened. And looking at the big bank of televisions, and this was on all, every TV. 1989, there was a youth revolt in China. The youth rose, rose up demanding more freedom. They built a goddess of democracy, statue based on our Statue of Liberty, and they were taking it through the streets. And the government of China called out the army and put them down. They came out with tanks. I remember watching this live. They called this Flower Man. The tanks are rolling in. He walks out there, not armed, and he holds up a single flower for peace and is standing there in the street to try and protect everybody and stop it. And the tanks ran him over. <laughs> right over. This is the way China deals with youthful democracy. Uh, wasn't pretty. Uh, <clears throat> Anti communism is spreading everywhere. Uh, Germany, which had been divided since World War II, the people are now demanding that Germany be, uh, be united. At the, at the, the, Berlin Wall be torn down. And in 1989, Mikhail Gorbachev says, open the gates. We're going to let East Germany and West Germany cross between the two. 
believing this would be a temporary thing. We'll just let them cross. So many people rushed the wall. They came up with, with hammers and whatever they could find, and they literally tore down the wall. I have a piece of it in my classroom if you want to look at it. Uh, Germany was reunited in 1990. It was absolutely incredible. That wall that was around this just came down. This is what it looked like before. These are people standing on top of the wall as they tore it down. Okay? Impressive. Impressive stuff. Soviet Union collapses in August 1991. Um, the USSR dissolves. It's replaced by 31 independent countries, the Commonwealth of Independent States, still around today. A uh, bunch of, of independent countries. We didn't know what was happening. Some people said the world's safer now. There's only one superpower. Soviet Union's gone. Others said... Holy crap, we're not safer. Who's got the news? We don't know where they all are. By the way, we still can't find all the news. Some of them disappeared, and we don't know where they went to. Uh, unemployment is going to get bad because we're going to close 34 military bases. We don't need them. The Soviet Union is gone. <coughs> a $52 billion uh, uh, order for a fighter jet was canceled. 52 billion, just gone. Unemployment's out of control. In 1991, war breaks out in Chechnya. The Russians send in troops. This is Chechnya right here, little big red part. And this is what that war looks like. That's what's left of Chechnya. There's still violence in Chechnya today, okay? Russia and Chechnya have been fighting since 1991. Still going on. Um, I know I'm skipping some of this stuff. All right, so then we finally get to the Persian Gulf War. Here's my war. So... 1990, Saddam Hussein, the leader of the, uh, the leader of Iraq, invades his neighbor Kuwait, and we're just kind of looking for an excuse to mess with Iraq anyway. And we go in. We set a, a deadline. We said you have to January 15th. If you don't if you don't get out of Kuwait by January 15th, the United States and 28 other nations will all unite to push you out of it. Saddam Hussein doesn't leave. We invade. The war lasts 37 days. Uh, very violent war. I'll show you some pictures from it. This is what we're talking about here. Kuwait's in this green area. Iraq's up here. We landed in Saudi Arabia and pushed people out of here. That's the Don Hussein. Um, I've already talked about some of this, so I'm kind of moving fast. Saddam Hussein, we know what happened to him. Eventually, we're going to capture him and execute him, right? We're going to, he's going to be hanged. George Bush and H. Norman Schwarzkopf. As the Iraqis were leaving, they lit the oil fields in Kuwait on fire. This is an actual photograph. It's environmental warfare. This smoke was so bad that it was seen here. It went up in the atmosphere and blew around the earth. And you could see the parts of this smoke in the United States. Okay? This is a terrible, terrible disaster. Colin Powell was kind of the strategic mind that, that, that won this war. Uh, H. Norman Schwarzkopf was the commander. Here's a photograph of what it looked like as we went in. 37 days, this war was completely televised. We watched the whole thing. Uh, Operation Desert Storm. Uh, this is what's left after after we routed the Iraqi army. Uh, the U.S. troops went through. Okay. Uh, this is just a restatement of it.
right, so last thing I'm going to talk about is the effects of the first Gulf War. Bush won this war very, very quickly, okay? Uh, too quick. He lost his re-election campaign because there's almost two years until his next election. And by the time the uh, election came about, people forgot about George Bush winning. And all they remembered was that we were in a recession, people were out of work, uh, American troops were still there, and this guy, Osama bin Laden, is out there talking about hating America and wanting to, to create a war against us. Why did he hate us? Well, because he wants us out of the Middle East. We're in traditionally Muslim countries interfering. Um, all right. So 1992, George Bush runs for re-election. He's running against this guy, Bill Clinton, along with Al Gore. Bill Clinton was not supposed to win. He was the governor of Arkansas, the poorest state in the country. Uh, but the Democrats ran him believing that they didn't want to waste any of their good candidates and let him let him lose to George Bush. Problem is, turns out he's very charismatic. He uh, for some reason, people thought he was good looking. I don't understand. But Bill Clinton was well spoken. He uh, uh, he he could sell himself well to the American people. The other thing that happens is a Texan, Ross Perot, decides to run for president that year too as an independent, and he siphons off a lot of Republican votes. In the end, George Bush loses his reelection campaign. Bill Clinton wins the blue states, Bush wins the red, and you can see that, that, that we're going to end up with Bill Clinton for, for, for our, our, our new president. All right, we're not going to go into the 90s and beyond because it didn't never show up on your test, okay? We got all the way through everything that should be testable. Don't forget, you've got a test due next week. You have a quiz is if you want the extra credit. It needs to be in by Monday. Uh,